Hello and welcome all to our first book at lunchtime for Michaelmas term 2023. Today we will be discussing this wonderful book, Courting India, uh, uh, England, Mughal India and the Origins of Empire. I'm Wes Williams. I am uh, very happily the former director of Torch. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but um, we thought that Christine, Professor Christine Gerard, the current director of Torch, wouldn't be able to be here today, but she is here. Give us a wave, Christine. Just managed it. Um, but I thought, well, we've, well, we agreed. Well, I've, you know, prepared this minimally and give her a break. And uh, uh, from next time onwards, Christine will be uh, introducing, no doubt. Um, for those who don't know or who are new to Book at Lunchtime, um, from Torch, it's one of our longest uh, and proudest, actually, uh, longest standing flagship events. Um, we have films of every single event featured on the website, uh, going right back to 2013. Um, so Book at Lunchtime has a growing history and also now a, a strong digital heritage. And in fact, I will say this, I've just got back from Berkeley, California, where I was for a couple of weeks, and there are regular viewers of Book at Lunchtime in Berkeley. Um, uh, and not sort of on, so this is not being broadcast, but it is filmed and then put on the website. Um, and it's, I like to think of it as our very own um, in our time, as it were. Um, and it clearly has, you know, uh, growing and, and uh, global um, uh, members of the audience watching it. Um, John, our communications officer here, can probably tell us how many thousands, but I won't ask you, I won't put you on the spot. Um, okay, so we're celebrating 10 years of Torch in 2023. Um, and if you don't know what Book at Lunchtime is, the other thing is that it's a, a platform or a forum for folk from within the humanities in Oxford uh, to have their work, uh, to basically have a mini tutorial on their work, have their work discussed by another colleague from within Oxford, um, uh, or sometimes two, and sometimes a colleague from outside Oxford. The format shifts slightly differently on different days. Um, today, we're very privileged to welcome Professor Nandini Das of Exeter College here in Oxford to discuss this already acclaimed book. Um, there have been some wonderful reviews of this work, including one from, again, our very own Peter Frankopan, who described it as beautifully written and masterfully researched. This has the makings of a classic. Another review described Nandini's book as startlingly eye-opening. If we want to truly understand the impact and legacy of the British Empire on our modern world, we have to start where it all began. Um, Literary review, an utterly absorbing narrative. I won't go through all the reviews, but they've been nearly all, I should say, involving uh, an adverb such as utterly, beautifully, startlingly, followed by a very praiseworthy set of adjectives. Joining Nandini for the discussion today, then, are Professor Susan Doran and Professor Joe Mashenska. Um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to an enlightening discussion. And with that, I hand over to Joe, who is our chair for the day, and we'll kind of run proceedings. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. Um, thank you all for coming today. I'm enormously excited um, about this event and was thrilled to be asked to participate in it. Um, it will be said many times in the course of this hour and it bears re-say this is a wonderful book uh, that I urge you all to go out and buy and read if you haven't already. Um, both exciting and stimulating um, novel, but also just a pleasure to read page to page, paragraph to paragraph. Um, I think I'll just explain the, the structure of the hour briefly. Would that be a good idea? So I'll, um, I'll just briefly introduce my co-panelists and I suppose myself. I haven't, I haven't formally been asked to do that, but I suppose I should explain uh, why I'm sharing. Um, I'll then um, invite um, Nandini to read um, a passage from her book. Um, after that, Sue and I will each um, speak for a few minutes in response to the book. Um, then we will talk kind of among ourselves as a panel about it for a few minutes. And all that will leave time at the end to then throw it open to the room and have a wider conversation, time for questions to Nandini and picking up on anything else that gets said in the conversation. So that's the general, um, the general order of things. So um, uh, let me then introduce um, Sue, my co-panelist, Susan Doran, who is Senior Research Fellow in History at Jesus College. Um, she is a extremely widely published authority on early modern British history. Um, her, I, I suppose it's fair to say that her work is mostly associated with, though by no means restricted to, the Elizabethan period, but that's where she's really made an um, unmistakable mark on all kinds of ways that we think about that period. Um, and, and, and indeed is continuing to make that mark um, with her forthcoming book, uh, which is titled We Think, 
from Tudors to Stuarts. Um, that is the latest news on the title. Not necessarily Sue's choice of title. She did ask me, <laughs> me to mention that. It is always, and that is interesting for our discussion, actually. It's always worth remembering with that there are lots of elements of a book that you sometimes get asked about by a reader. You know, why, why did you choose this picture? Why didn't you choose that picture? Well, I didn't actually choose or not, you know, it's not all within our control. And that is worth bearing in mind that some of these things are subject to negotiation. Um, Nandini Das, the author of Courting India, is um, professor in the Faculty of English here in Oxford, um, educated at Jabalpur University in India here in Oxford. In fact, at my old college, at my current college, Univ, is Nandini's old college, uh, where the teaching of Helen Cooper sparked an interest in early modern romance, uh, and then a PhD at Cambridge, um, taught in Liverpool before um, coming back to Oxford to teach. Um, I will say one other thing by way of introducing Nandini that amused me, which is when I was Googling this book in preparation for this um, event and reading reviews and so on, I was, I was stunned to discover that one of the websites, possibly even the publisher's website, describes the book, I think, as a stunning debut, which was news to me. I thought this, is, this really tells us something about how non-academic publishing and, and academic publishing do or sometimes don't see one another. <laughs> in that there is this funny way, and this might be something we talk about, there is this funny way in which, uh, in which a press like Bloomsbury, there, at times it feels like the, the academic work we do sort of doesn't exist for them, <laughs> because this is Nandini's debut in terms of being a, um, her debut as a, as a trade monograph, but by no means her debut as an author. She's an extremely established scholar of, early modern, um, of the early modern world, of, of, of its various respects, through her own writing on romance and other topics and also via the amazing work she did spearheading the Tide project, um, which moved to Oxford with her and enriched our um, intellectual and cultural lives in all kinds of ways that I'm sure many people in the room have been aware of and have benefited from. So she, as, as well as being a great scholar in her own, in her own right, Nandini's a brilliant facilitator of scholarship. And, of, and, and I think this is important to stress, actually, a fantastic mentor of younger scholars. I think that's some, some, an area where we need more and more energy in our academic world and Nandini is someone who's really led the way on that in terms of showing how um, leading a project is also a way to foster the careers of brilliant younger people as well. Um, and I'm Joe Mashenska. I also teach at the English faculty. I'm a colleague of Nandini's. I work on early modern um, literature principally. Um, Thomas Rowe first came across my, uh, my radar and not via his Indian embassy but via his Ottoman embassy, um, which took place later when I, when I was working on the 17th century polymath Sir Kenelm Digby, who fought a big sea battle in the Eastern Mediterranean at, at what the English called Skanderun, Iskanderun, um, which caused a real headache for Roe when he was uh, um, on the embassy. And, and, and I found myself reading his amazing book of letters, which is full of these incredible stories of the Ottoman court. Uh, it's an interesting book for various reasons because it was edited by Samuel Richardson. Quite interesting that Richardson was editing this. Uh, that was new to me. The fact that this man would be editing this actual body of diplomatic correspondence and then go on to write a great epistolary novel um, in English. Um, so uh, I knew of Rowe in India because I'd read a bit around him when he came across my Digby radar. But this um, rich and fulsome account of his experience there was a total revelation to me. I think that's all I will say by way of introduction, and I will at this point hand over to Nandini to read us a choice excerpt from the book. Thank you, Joe, and thank you all for coming. I know for many of us, coming to any event at the beginning of term is a big ask, so I'm deeply grateful to have so many um, friendly faces and encouraging nods um, around the room. Um, so. When John invited me to do this, um, my brief was to choose a little extract, which should take no more than six to seven minutes, he said very firmly in his email. And I'm going to try to stick to that brief. Um, so I thought what I'd do is read you a little bit from the moment where Thomas Rowe first arrives in India. This is 1615 we are talking about. The East India Company is about 15 years old. Um, it had been licensed in 1600, um, but it has been desperately trying to find a toehold in South Asia, particularly in India. And Roe has been sent by James I, and we might talk a little bit about that, the background to that, um, sending in a way. But Roe is already deeply aware that he's on shaky grounds um, because, frankly, no one takes him seriously and no one in India where the Portuguese have already been for the best part of a century. Um, 
really understands who the English are at this point still. Um, so Roe has his work cut out for him, essentially, to establish himself, establish the English, um, and to make their presence felt. It started with a letter. When Zulfikar Khan, the governor of Surat, received the news of Roe's arrival, he responded civilly enough. A messenger was sent to the English ships with a welcoming gift of fruits, and the governor's accompanying letter promised to send 30 horsemen to attend Roe's formal landing at the port. He even offered to secure a house for Roe if the company merchants could identify a suitable one. Yet even as a flurry of farewell dinners and exchanges of gifts among the ship's captains and passengers continued on board the East India Company ships, Roe opened up a brisk exchange of letters with Zulfikar Khan on a point of procedure that looks puzzlingly minor at the outset. On 23rd of September, he wrote to the governor that while he knew that the customs officials at the port were under orders to search everything that came ashore, he expected the rules to be waived for him and for his men. I, being an ambassador from a mighty king, did expect to have all things appertaining to myself and my followers free by privilege, he wrote. And that if any affront were offered me, I would return to the ships until I had an order from the king, his master. Zulfikar Khan, a highly experienced Mughal courtier himself, wrote back with polite diplomacy. The custom search was standard procedure, he pointed out, but he would make something of an exception in recognition of Roe's status. An officer would check and seal the ambassador's belongings at the waterside before it was transferred to the house where he was going to stay. And the customs officer would later visit the house, not in the nature of a search, but only to be able to answer that they had seen what Roe had landed. Roe agreed. So on the appointed day, Roe lands with quite a degree of you know, carefully orchestrated fanfare, literally fanfare. He had taken trumpeters with him. Um, but he launches immediately into a diplomatic tussle that was going to be the first of many on a very long day. And it doesn't show Roe obstinate and combative in a particularly good light. Um, as Roe got ready to proceed to the town, the Surat officials repeated their demand for a custom search, allowing Roe to launch into a dramatic protest. He declared he was the ambassador of a mighty and free prince. For him to submit to so much slavery as an ambassador would be a dishonor to his master, since in both Europe and most parts of Asia, ambassadors were privileged he said, not to be subject to common and barbarous usage. If the rep representatives of the Mughal emperor in Surat could not do the same, he would return to the ships and wait for the emperor's own decision, rather than sacrificing the right and freedom due to the ambassador of a Christian king. So the Mughal go governor and his um, people kind of have a long fraught exchange with him. But by the end, you know, it's almost evening, they give up. They say, okay, these people have traveled for about eight months. We'll just let them go to their house. So they take them to their house, put them up, and we'll sort out this customs business later on. It is possible to excuse Roe's opening salvo and surat, as is often the case in the few subsequent historical studies of his embassy as a reaction to the circumstances in which he found himself. The emphasis in those accounts tends to be on the indignity imposed on the English and on Mughal capriciousness. Um, and those words, indignity and capriciousness, are ones that crop up quite often in kind of scholarship of this period, particularly in the first Victorian editions of Rose Journal. The causal chain that such readings suggest is a familiar one. 
it ends with the responsibility of the encounter being imposed on the recipient rather than on the initiator and allows Roe to emerge from it enshrined in his moral high ground. Yet along with the violin, the velvet suits and his debts, Roe had carried with him fears and assumptions, habits and prejudices, and above all, memories that had been shaped by his known world. He had gathered his experience from the formal courtliness of Spain, the jungles of Guiana, and the stifling overwrought chambers of the adult parliament of James I in London, navigating his way through disappointments, losses, and love. Um, and one of the things that I point out is that what Roe does um, in that moment in Surat when he lands is a very deliberate structuring of a set of events which evokes and in fact directly imitates a set of events that had happened a few years ago um, in London and involved perhaps the one man that the English dearly loved to hate in this period, the formidable and remarkably kind of um, clever Spanish ambassador to England, the Earl of Gondomar. Gondomar had structured exactly a similar kind of event to kind of balance the relationship of power between himself and James I when he had landed. The shadow of Gondomar looming behind this, the most important moment of Rowe's career so far, is a striking reminder of how that motley patchwork of memory works and why our distinctions between European and non-European, Indian and English strands in such encounters sometimes demand rethinking in its light. It reveals Rowe's dawning understanding of the highly developed diplomatic procedures and ceremonies at the Mughal court and how they shape his use of the Spanish exemplar to create his own definitive assertion of his English autonomy. Taken alone, we could see this as a validation of the shared customs of Europe to which Roe often refers in his conflict with the governor of Surat against the non-European state infrastructure that he had encountered. Yet the usual adversarial lines shimmer and shift, challenging any easy binary characterization of the East and the West, the exotic foreign and the familiar foreign left behind. Thank you. That was wonderful, thank you. Um, Sue, over to you. Yes, I'm not going to have the approach of a tutor. I'm going to give a mini lecture. And I'm actually, some of the things I want to say picks up on the extract we've just heard. But first of all, I want to congratulate Nandini on writing a scholarly work that reads like a novel. Her imaginative writing brings colour to all the descriptions, whether of people, places or events. One of Nandini's techniques is to begin a chapter with a story and use it as an entry point for wider issues. For example, in a chapter on hidden figures, it begins with the grieving at the Mughal court in January 16, 16th at the death of the emperor Jahangir's three-year-old granddaughter. And then it opens up to consider the kind of life she might have led largely through looking at the life her sister led and also the lives of the women who are in the harem. And that's a technique I think you use quite often within the book. This is a big book. Although ostensibly covering only three years or so of Thomas Rowe's embassy, Nandini travels over time and place, not just in discussing Rowe's experiences in India and how they were reported by different players, but also in examining the events and writings in England that shadowed and influenced the diplomatic mission. We've heard about one of those already. One of Nandini's major contributions to the historiography of the Rome mission is her argument that we've really just heard and the evidence that Rowe's previous personal and political experiences influenced his perceptions and conduct in India. 
Nandini shows how the language he used in his journal and letters to describe the Mughal court uh, mirrors the criticisms that he and others had previously made about the Jacobean state, the factional intrigues around the Howards, the corruptions within England's legal system and royal court, and the wasteful opulence of the king. All these features Roe transposed to the Mughal court and hence misunderstood much of it. Similarly, at his first meeting with the emperor, Roe was bemused by the spectacle of the public Durbar because he couldn't place it within the English context, especially the English parliamentary system. He failed to comprehend the formal meeting's political and social significance. Additionally, Roe's perceptions of and interactions with the emperor and his court were shaped by what he had heard and read from travellers' accounts and stock images derived from plays such as Marlowe's Tamburlaine. Hence, again, he misjudged the nature of imperial power and authority. So as Nandini says, the kind of perceptions he's bringing into play are what really mars the embassy and, and, and creates the journal which shows us a really semi-forced picture of the nature of the Mughal court. Because of a lack of knowledge and forethought, Roe was wrong-footed in the ritual gift exchanges of the Mughal court. We learn from Nandini that the East India Company made a major faux pas when it failed to provide Roe with a gift for the Crown Prince Quran. While the gifts it recommended for the emperor could not have been more unsuitable. The Ornote coach and virginals were not magnificent enough to impress Jahangir, who was regularly gifted rich and eye-catching items, such as elephants that were decorated in gold and silver, richly saddled horses, dazzling jewels, and splendid textiles. Even worse, the voyage, which was six or eight months, in a damp hold had rotted the materials of the coach, fading the velvet, warping the wood and tarnishing the gilding. All this Nandini explains beautifully. According to his own account, Roe saved the day by improvising, offering a gift to Jan Hanjir that he had devised himself. He'd found a, a stone uh, when he'd been in the West Indies. I'm not quite sure why he brought it with him, but it was just as well he did. And it was, um, it was uh, created into a form of seal, I think. Yeah. And then it was wrapped or put in a crystal box. And then it was put into an ornamental purse that Roe had, had bought for about 25 shillings, which was not insignificant, but not huge, in a, in a pouch, uh, an embroidered couch. And this ingenuity paid off uh, as Jahangir liked its novelty value and took pleasure in the gradual unfolding of the gift. However, the damage had been done and Jahangir thought King James a ruler of very little account. As Nandi Nandini demonstrates, Roe's preconceptions and prejudices frequently stra straight-jacketed him in his encounters with the officials and royals of the Mughal Empire. We've just heard about what happens when, when he first arrives. And running right the way through the book, you hear how he's determined to, uh, to keep to the precedence that he understood from uh, England and to his own diplomatic immunity. Um, he later on at the Durbar, he refuses to kowtow before the emperor and objected to standing amongst the ranks of the Mughal noblemen, as was customary at the Mughal court. Um, in England, as Nandini points out, there was a fear in stage plays of what was called turning Turk, forgetting one's identity as an Englishman and dissolving the barriers between different cultures. So it wasn't just, and it also included the sense of superiority that he had, but it was also, as Nandini explains again beautifully, it was that fear that his own identity as an Englishman would, would, would be eroded. And it was for that reason, for example, that he made everyone in his retinue wear English clothes in the Indian summer and hence swelter, uh, or 
sit at tables and chairs very uncomfortably rather than sitting according to local custom on mats. Um, he was, uh, although he tried to disparage the Mughal court and its magnificence, you know, it was wasteful opulence, as I said, at the same time, it really unsettled him because he realized the English just could not compete. Its magnificence, its grandeur. Um, and again, this is shown um, very well by Nandini, particularly when he takes leave of, um, of the leave taking of Quram. Throughout the book, Nandini draws our attention to the high stakes nature of Rowe's embassy and the risks integral to overseas commercial ventures at the time, emphasizing how these enterprises gambled with people's lives as well as shipping and profits with the sensitivity to language that we'd expect from a literary scholar. She points out how the words permeating the vocabulary from the, of the trading companies, venture, adventurer, lotteries, wages, highlight the speculative and risky nature of their enterprises. Rose, Rose himself had lost pretty much everything through engaging in a a voyage, the 1609 Guyana voyage promoted by Walter Raleigh. And he was taking on a huge gamble in embarking on the mission to India at some personal cost as he had to leave his new bride behind. Until the very end, the gamble looked as if it had not paid off. For in his letters, Roe recited his many frustrations, his long lasting illness and intense homesickness for little in the way of recompense. There is much else I could talk about. The conflicting sources that Nandini uses, the irrelevance of the embassy to the Mughals, the rivalry of the English with the Dutch and the Portuguese, and Rowe's final success through the machinations at the Mughal court, which he didn't really understand. This is a really rich book, and you readers will find an enormous amount in it to enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you for that, Sue. Um, Sue and I didn't exchange responses before this event, uh, so I'm going to be um, picking up on some things that she mentioned that that, were, that, that certainly resonated with my own response to the book, um, but but perhaps with some with some differences of emphasis. I mean, I think the characterization you gave at the start, a scholarly work that reads like a novel, um, is absolutely right. Um, I am interested uh, in um, some of the questions that this book raises uh, for for all of us as panelists. I think about um, whether or not it matters to that 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 a person or a book belongs within a scholarly discipline. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting that this is a book that has naturally found itself at the um, centre of a of a panel that has a literary scholar at one end and a historian at the other end and Nandini somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's a book that raises really interesting questions about what those identities and the differences and the blurry lines at times between them mean at this particular moment. Um, and, um, and whether we want to say that, you know, that it doesn't really matter, that, 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 that you know, literary historians are a kind of historian and are functioning as historians a lot of the time. Um, or whether we also draw differences. So I would be really interested to hear, obviously it's something that Nandini and I have spoken about um, in conversation over, over the years, and I found that really useful, but I would be really interested to hear her, some of her reflections when we get to the discussion on having this book in the world, um, partly because, um, and I've, as I mentioned before, sort of done versions of this myself, one of the ways that, that scholars in literature, if they're interested in finding a public audience for their work, and we're, we're, which is you know, really about finding a public audience for the early modern period, for the period in which they have a kind of commitment. Um, one of the best ways to do that is to write something that looks to or is legible to publishers, to readers, to booksellers and so on as popular history. But it quite often feels to, the, to, the, to those of us who are writing it, I think, like we're still doing something that, 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 is, that is a kind of literary scholarship that, that, that draws in all kinds of ways and, and picks up on and, and sort of develops and takes in new directions skills that we've learned as, as literary scholars. But because there doesn't seem to be as much of a, of a wide audience in the current historical moment for books that call themselves literary criticism, 
we're sort of discouraged from from branding them in that way. And so I'd be really interested to to to, to hear more of your reflections now the book is out in the world and it, and it's had responses from reviewers and readers um, to where that's left you in terms of how you understand yourself as a scholar. Um, maybe maybe that's you know maybe partly from having run an interdisciplinary project as I've mentioned. Those are distinctions that seem less relevant to you now. That in itself would be really interesting. Um, but I think it's a book that raises really interesting questions about, about um, how we categorise the work that we do and whether those categories are useful or, or inhibiting. Um, so to pick up on a couple of things that Sue said, that, or at least things that I thought as I read the book with those, with those questions in mind, um, I, was, I was very struck by that same feature that, that, that Sue drew attention to, which is the way you kind of open chapters, often with a kind of arresting scene that then sort of unfolds and opens up a whole new horizon. But I also felt, as I read through the book, that that was very that that was both a stylistic choice. It was it was thinking about the reader and what would be engaging for the reader, but it also seemed to me, at least, like it was part and parcel of um, the book's really exciting and complex confrontation with the question of beginning more broadly. So there's a there, there's a really interesting passage. Um, I'll just, just find it quickly. It's quite early on in the book. Um, that thinks very directly at the opening of a chapter. It's chapter three, India Englished, which begins, it is possible to think about Rowe's mission simply as a string of firsts. And then you go on to list all the things it was the first of. The problem with stories about first, how, firsts, however, is that it demands to be, is that such stories demand to be placed center stage. Stories that came before fade into a blurred distance. Other voices become barely acknowledged murmurs. And so that felt like a really interesting moment at which Nandini's sort of decisions as a writer, thinking again about the kind of engagement of the reader, were also completely bound up with and inextricable from the larger historiographical stakes of the book, which is to say that any choice about where to begin is a stylistic decision that's also a political decision and a, and a, and a, and a sort of philosophical decision of a certain kind, because it, it, because it is a decision to prioritise a certain point of origin at the expense of many other possibles. And so that felt like, um, like, a, like a, really interesting, a really interesting moment where, um, where the style and the form of the book Seem to be seem to be working together in very interesting ways to 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 underpin and advance some of some of its kind of implicit and very subtle, but nonetheless crucial arguments for how it was actually presenting history, and and that I think for me is one of the the most exciting things about the book is that it it's 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 extremely focused on this on this one man and as you said this kind of few years within his life. But I really do think it's a book with much, with much wider implications for how we think about the histories that get told and don't get told and that we choose to tell or not to tell. And, and also their sort of longer, um, the, the kind of longer afterlives or implications of those decisions. Um, so the, um, and that seems to be the, the other side of Nandini's in, interest in beginnings is that I think it's, it's clearly and this again is something that she writes about extremely interestingly in the book, but I, I felt reading it that, that some of the inescapable stakes of this book, of a focus on the first English embassy to India, is what's the relationship going to be between these events and the imperial history that we know is coming later, but that row doesn't, right? And, and we all know what an enormous conceptual challenge that is to simultaneously do justice to the um, you know, both to, both to later histories and to things kind of latent within these scenes of encounter where you can see certain things emerging which are going to be reconfigured and, and, and lead to, um, or, you know, are going to be kind of recognisable in terms of later, of later imperial configurations. How can you acknowledge that and do justice to it without telling a linear history of inevitability? as if the kind of seeds of empire are already sprouting from the, um, from, you know, from, from the um, things that Roe plants when he's there. And that's something that Nandini treats extremely delicately um, and, um, and sort of admirably. But I think that's a, that, that question of not just where we begin, but if we begin in a certain way, can we, can we do so without instigating a kind of inevitable onrush towards a destination that we know is coming and, and make the act of beginning in a sense already defined by its suddenly inevitable seeming end. And so the way that this book kind of dwells in all the kinds of contingencies that, that, and, and um, events that Sue's brought out so well 
Um, again, they're, they're, they're extremely gripping as a narrative, but I really do think that they raise these, these, these much larger questions about how, um, how, how and to what end um, history gets told. Um, I had more to say about that. I realize I'm, I'm getting, being a bad chair and keeping on other people's time, but not my own. And so I might, I might draw to a close okay, in a second. Absolutely fine. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, so maybe, and the, the, the other thing I think I'll say, well, I'll, I'll just add a couple of other details that, that really struck me. Um, one thing that the, that the book also plays around with really fascinatingly and kind of draws upon Nandini's very unique, um, sort of s s large and unique set of scholarly competences is the, um, these fascinating moments where we get kind of reversibility of perspective. So we see the English view of India through Roe and through his competitors, but, but we also get moments where the gaze is, is reversed in really fascinating ways. So again, another moment I can probably find quickly where we're suddenly given a, um, um, a glimpse of, of, of the 17th century from, from a Sanskrit poem that Nandini quotes. Um, and, she, and, and she calls it, she says, it offers a glimpse from the other side. And I was really struck by that phrase because that felt like something we're given, we're given throughout the book. Although what's, you know, I thought, thought in a sense the kind of marvellous payoff of that, and you've already alluded to this, Sue, is that Roe just doesn't seem to have mattered to, to, to Jahangir very much at all. So what we're also given is a kind of non-gaze from the other side, right? This kind of intense fascination being trained in one direction. And as far as we can tell from Jahangir's own, own you know, journals and recollections, the guy barely registered on his consciousness. And it's the other way around too, because I, I mentioned about the death of the granddaughter. And we have this, as I said, a beautiful description of the grief at the court. And actually I have political repercussions because they were just not interested in getting down to business. And Roe barely mentions it. He doesn't notice that, 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 that the court is caught up in this emotional life. So it works both ways. And Absolutely. I think that's something you Absolutely. So, 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 so the book is this kind of tapestry of, of, of forms of evidence and, and, and things that approach the, the, these phenomena from different directions, but they're not identical. They're not reciprocal. The, these are not as straightforward as parts of a whole that, that can be reconstructed. Yes, They're... you do get a sense there is not a meeting of minds here. Absolutely. <laughs> Running right the way through. I mean, it is more of an encounter. Absolutely. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's not something that goes deeper than that. Absolutely. And that, and that also sets up the final thing I think I'll say, which is another, um, and, then, and then move into the gear that we're already slightly in of discussing together, which I'm keen to do. Um, the other thing that, uh, I think is really powerful about the, the kind of wider states of the book is one thing Nandini talks about in it is is a kind of um, a kind of scepticism towards the language of first encounter. A, the, the, I mentioned firsts in general as something that she's interested in um, in in uh, scrutinizing as something that we prioritize, and it is amazing. Um, na, you know, Nandini and I, and I and Sue to have done you know I think about doing things for the radio, they always want to know, was it the first? And the answer is usually, well, depend, depends what you mean by first, right? It's such a slippery category of, uh, of anything. Um, and, and, and I thought the book really showed that beautifully, that, 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 that there has at times been a tendency in scholarly accounts to sort of privilege the moment of first encounter. But actually what, what might be first judged by one set of criteria is actually already prepared for, mediated by, um, framed by a whole set of preconceptions, pre-existing narratives, forms of reading, things that, again, so in the same way that there's, a, that, that there's always a prior history, as in that moment I read before, there's also a kind of prior textuality, which then frames um, what ends up happening. You know, what, uh, in a sense, when two people meet, they've already been made in, in, in so many ways by so many discourses um, that, that that whole that whole complex needs to be borne in mind, as with the Gondomar moment that you show, you know, and then Rose replaying of that script. You know, there's a kind of, um, yeah, there is, there is only kind of mediation, no matter how far we go back. And that again felt like part of the claim, um, as with the examples from the um, trade text that she gave, of kind of of attending closely to the sort of textuality of these, of these moments. I'll stop there. Um, and as I said, I think now we talk amongst ourselves, but I wonder first, Nadine, if you wanted to pick up on anything in particular that, that either of us said and respond to that, and then we can talk a bit amongst Thank the three so of us. Thank you so much, both of you, actually. Um, and goodness, I mean, you, both of you articulate my book so much better than I could. <laughs> can I please have the two of you with me? <laughs> um, but yes, I think, uh, Joe, one of the things that you picked up on, so, um, 
was that idea of first encounter, but also the disciplinary kind of negotiation of English and my own background in English literature, um, particularly. Um, so maybe I'll pick up on those two questions first. In a way, the book starts with my own um, curiosity, perhaps, as an early modern scholar, a scholar of the 16th and 17th century, about this Anglo-Indian encounter and the way the history is told. And as Joe mentioned, um, that history tends to be where row crops up usually. Um, that history tends to be proleptic in the sense that it's always told from the end point of that timeline. So looking back um, from the 18th and 19th centuries towards the, the beginnings. Um, and the result of that inevitably is that historiography tends to assume that the British Empire was always meant to be. Whereas the reality was that when the English go to India um, in the early 17th century, um, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, who's a direct contemporary of James I, his father, Akbar the Great, was a direct cont contemporary of Elizabeth I. Um, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir is, rules over 1.24 million square miles. Um, and his personal revenue every year, so not the state's revenue, but his own personal revenue, is the equivalent of 54 million pounds per year, um, which is about 10 times the annual state revenue of England in this period. So there's a huge disparity of power and resources between the two countries, two nations in this period. Um, there's also another deeper disparity, which is that for a person like Roe or any other East India Company merchant, you have to put yourself in their shoes. Um, you realize how strange this country would have been to them. Here you are going from a country where largely people speak the same language. Um, and you've gone through an enormous religious change where essentially Protestantism is the the main and single religion, in a way. You're going into a subcontinent where there are not only multiple languages, but multiple religions at the same time. That variety, that diversity is disconcerting. Um, and there are ways in which Roe himself and the East India Company merchants that he deals with negotiate with that. And for me, partly the, the first question from which I started was that, you know, how do we understand that moment without the fallback, the framework of the empire that we tend to fall back on? Because that framework did not exist in this period. There is, however, a bigger, perhaps, or perhaps just much more basic question um, for me personally. Um, and that's both as an individual and as a scholar. I work mainly on literatures of travel in the 16th and 17th centuries. So this question of encounter is something that I'm really interested in. What happens when two different cultures encounter each other? But here we are in Oxford in Michaelmas term with loads of freshers wandering around everywhere, um, getting lost all the time. Um, and a couple of decades ago, I was one of them. I had come to Oxford as an undergraduate and this was my first time away from home. And Oxford at the same time was both old and new for me. You know, I have a terrible sense of direction, honestly. Um, for a travel scholar of travel writing, I'm terrible. Um, so I was constantly getting lost, but I was constantly also going through those moments where I would turn a corner and I go, ah, I know exactly what this place is because I've read about it. And my undergraduate friends still tease me about that, that the one phrase they constantly heard from me in that first year, in fact, my undergraduate tutors still tease me about that, um, Helen Cooper and John Mee at University College, that the one phrase they constantly heard from me was, I know that thing because I've read about it in such and such thing. So that idea that the, a new world is hardly ever really new to us um, is something that 
I experienced and something that you see constantly travelers in this period exp experiencing, that their own personal encounters are constantly being framed by expectations and assumptions that actually take them back home in multiple ways. So you asked me about you know, where I sit, both literally, demonstrably, but also in terms of my methodological um, inclinations between English and history. I suppose for me, it is an interviewing of those two, which comes perhaps organically from that very basic question of where do we situate ourselves in time as human beings? Um, and that temporal situation or in the here and now for me is always framed by the past. And that past is both individual but also collective. And literature is part of that collective past. That's a very waffling That's answer to know, wonderful. what you wonderful. asked. <laughs> Sue, do you want to? Yes, I mean, I was conscious um, when I was reading your book whether I could write it as a historian, and I knew I couldn't, because as a historian, I am so bound by the evidence that I would express quite a lot of things which I loved about the book. This is not a criticism, but I would have expressed them completely differently. So I'll just give one example. Uh, you wrote about the, uh, the plays that were lampooning James I, and you said the audience laughed at this. Well, I would have said, did the audience laugh? I don't know. <laughs> the evidence doesn't say that. So I would have written about it from the point of view of how it was put on in the theatre and what it would have, you know, what the author was getting at and how it might have been received. And that's the difference I was very conscious of. So I don't write as if it's a novel. It's, I wish I could, but I can't because my training just doesn't let me. I think that's a really interesting point, isn't it? So from my perspective as someone working on early modern literature and to some extent on early modern theater, um, my response to that or the, the rationale from which I would be building my picture would be to look at things like say publishing history. So I talk about the game of chess, which is Middleton's play, uh, which talks in fact has Gondomar as a key figure within it. Um, and my rationale there as a literary scholar would be to see how deeply popular this play was mm -hmm. in this period, how often it was put up, how um, ever present it was within popular discourse. Um, and so my reading comes from that. But you've also hit on something else that um, as someone working on cross-cultural encounters in this period, I was deeply conscious of doing. And that's around something that, Joe, you picked up on, which is about perhaps widening the lens or flipping the lens occasionally. When we talk about English travels, English cross-cultural encounters, we have an abundance of paperwork. My goodness, I've never been so grateful about bureaucracy and form filling as I have been when I've been writing this book. And thank goodness for the East India Company's utter obsession with paperwork of all kinds and expense receipts. We know about the 24 shillings of the purse because of expense receipts. So there's a lot we have to be thankful for. But one of the downsides of that is that fragmentary presences within that narrative get drowned. And those fragmentary presences tend to be of marginal voices. So for instance, um, there's a moment in my book where I talk about one person who only appears in half a sentence in um, a London, in the Deptford County records. Um, and this is a man called Samuel Mansour. Um, he is a, a sailor. We know he's from East of India. That's where I come from um, in Bengal. Um, and he had come to England on East India Company ships. And by the way, um, the the long voyages were terrible for um, um, health and survival of sailors, frankly. So you had pretty much, you could expect about 70% loss of life on any of these voyages. That meant of 10 sailors, only three would probably likely come back home at the end of any single voyage. But that also meant that the East India Company ships had to be brought back home by somebody 
with all their trading goods. And what happens is that we lose sight of the absolute abundance of sailors from all parts of the world, the Gujarati, the Bengali, the Japanese sailors who were wandering around in places like Deptford and Portsmouth and Southampton in this period. And Samuel Mansour is one of them. He comes on one of those ships. Um, he falls in love. He marries a, ma a woman um, called Jane. And the only reason we know about him is because the East India Company, in a half a sentence, refuses him permission to take his wife back to India. Now, within a general kind of, a kind of scholarly, conventional historiography, that little fragment of evidence would not really feature for much because that's only one person, right? What does it, how much does that count for, that fragmentary evidence? For me, however, um, it, writing this book in this form allows me a little bit more leeway to pause at that moment and give that fragmentary presence voice and space. Um, that our, perhaps to some extent, our European historiographical methodologies do not allow for, yeah. in a way. Yeah. I, I want to throw it open to the room in a moment, I just, just, but I'll just comment very briefly on this. I think it's a fascinating discussion. I think the examples you've both used are really interesting because I think, to my mind, they're, they're distinct but clearly connected. So, so the, the one that you pointed to, which I think is so interesting, the audience laughed. Um, <laughs> it's, great, it's great to imagine Nandini writing that and saying, you know, the audience, you know, presumably responded in some way, but I couldn't possibly comment. You know, be the kind of, you know I wouldn't make for quite as good a, good a chapter. But, um, but um, so, so in that moment, I would guess, that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of ask you this, you know, my guess is that's less, that sounds to me less like a history versus literature distinction and more like a writing with one's scholarly peers principally in mind and writing with a general audience principally in mind. Because I think a, I think a literary, a historian, you know, a historian of the theatre would probably qualify that or, or, or at least talk about all the evidence we have for different forms of audience response and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas what you're talking about is a kind of ethical imperative to, re to, to respond to the, to, you know, to, to, to not just um, sort of accept the limits of the archive, uh, you know, as you, in, in line with things you've done with the Thai project, right? To kind of see the limits of the archive as a kind of stimulus to think in different ways in order to return a kind of texture to these lives. But, but within the book, you know, because, because, the, because the mode of the book, you know, the imperative is to engage the reader, you're sort of able to do both of those things. You, you know, you're, you're able to say the audience laughed because that's a more engaging way of saying something that doesn't have the same kind of ethical stakes. But because you're in that mode, you can use that mode to make a, a, a kind of claim about the sort of lives we should be recovering yeah. and the ways in which we should be recovering them. Well, partly, I think. But however, I think I'm also, um, and in a way it's difficult and perhaps not entirely desirable to shed off that academic imperative as well. So I'm very conscious when I make those statements. Um, and actually, this is where I'm deeply grateful to Bloomsbury that my editor didn't bat an eye, um, eye when I said, well, I am going to have about a thousand footnotes in this book. Thank you very much. Um, um, so fair warning there. Um, <laughs> um, but so one of the moments where you do have that kind of audience reaction that I talk about is um, one of the Lord Mayor's shows. Um, and in those cases, as with most theatre history, you do have specific archival kind of proof, yeah. evidence of audience re reaction and that kind of phenomenological or affective response of the audience yeah. is, has been amply theorized, I think, within academic practice, in, in theatre history, in early modern theatre history. So in this case, for instance, there's a particular letter by an Italian um, member of the Italian ambassador's retinue who's talking about the other members of the audience he can see mm -hmm. as he is watching the Lord Mayor's show. Right. Um, so we have quite concrete evidence yeah. in some cases of that kind of audience yeah. response. So the readers can always see the basis on which you're making the mm. claims, even if there's a kind of in inferential yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Thank you. I think we will at this point throw it open to the floor. So please do stick your hand up if you have a question. Yeah, over here straight away.
That's a wonderful question, actually. Um, and you're absolutely right that um, to some extent, and certainly there were certain chapters when where I was doing when I was doing the research, um, I was tracking the objects more than I was tracking human beings at those moments because the objects tell a story from a slightly different perspective occasionally. Um, but it's also the case that both the East India Company and the Mughal um, court records of this period are particularly good at enabling us to understand that weight, the cultural weight that objects carry with them. Um, and there's a lot of scholarship that has happened around this idea of, um, you know, the the weight of memory that objects have, the object memory itself, essentially, which I found really useful. Um, you only have to think about, there's been some wonderful new work on migrants and the objects people carry with them during forced migrations and the kind of memories they carry. So um, one of the things that I very much wanted to do was unpack that. But the other thing, um, that objects and particularly paintings um, within that helped me to do was to think about perspectives again and the reading of uh, paintings for instance and different perspectives. So that image which is the cover image of the book with James the first looking like someone who has been waiting for a bus for far too long um, is um, that image is a copy by the man in yellow at the right in the corner who's holding a painting in his hand. So that man in yellow is one of the foremost artists at the Mughal court. His name is Bichitra or Wondrous or Varied. He's a Hindu artist at the Mughal court. And um, I think the general consensus at this point is that he copies James I from a Decrets portrait of James that um, Roe or one of the earlier East India Company merchants had carried with them. I think that act of copying itself is a, is a conversation between the two cultures. So part of my attempt was to use the objects to unearth those voices as well. We were talking about fragmentary voices previously. Um, and in this case, it allows me to access the voice of Bichitra um, in a way that, you know, Jahangir's own journal wouldn't. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, there's one here. I think uh, we ought to clarify in the sense that when, um, for me, when I'm talking about Quoting India, I'm talking about the narrative. So when we're talking about, you know, it being readable like a novel, we are not talking about just writing imaginatively around it. Um, it is very much and in a way I'm spoiled for choice in terms of the material because there is an abundance of archival material, which Quoting India um, kind of is based on. It's very rare. Um, that you, when you write about a particular embassy, you have perspectives not only from both sides, but essentially you can map an embassy day to day from both perspectives, both sides of that question, and which we can with Roe, because Roe writes a daily journal, and rather unusually, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir himself writes a daily journal, and you can juxtapose those almost day to day, hour by hour sometimes. So it's very much, um, kind of based on that. But um, in terms of the writing, I was also very aware that I wanted it to be readable in a way, and I wanted that narrative to have that multiplicity of voices, that writing um, a conventional history of the English um, in seven, early 17th century India might not be able to address, and we've talked a little bit about that, about the fragmented, the marginal voices, for instance, about the ways in which um, sometimes the, the Dutch and the Portuguese archives can come in, or um, in terms of the ways in which cultural memory impacts on our understanding of how the English perceive um, India. So there's a little moment, for instance, 
in the book where I talk, um, I use a letter by an East India, fairly minor East India company merchant who's grumbling about Gujarati tradesmen, the, the big Gujarati trades families, trading families. And he says, in India, the big fish eat the little fish. And the tiniest, the littlest fish have absolutely no chance of survival at all. As a literary scholar, I juxtapose that immediately with a moment in um, William Shakespeare's play Pericles, where exactly that same metaphor is used by ordinary English sailors, or ordinary commoners talking about the powers that be. And I talk about how that adage or that metaphor circulates within England in shared cultural memory and then permeates their lens, becomes part of the lens through which the English are looking at the Indian structure of society. So there's juxtaposition perhaps, but not novelization in the sense of imaginative kind of filling in. Of I'm the sorry gaps. if I gave that impression because <laughs> I did not intend to. <laughs> well, I'll perhaps just, just, just say this as a, as a closing remark perhaps it doesn't it doesn't sound like the kind of sexiest thing to end on the footnotes of a book but you did mention them and I do think it's really important and it makes and and it's and it, you do sometimes have to fight to keep these things in a book but the reason they are so important is precisely for this reason is that I think I think what the notes do is provide a kind of constant undercurrent of reassurance that everything you say is based in something yeah. that that doesn't mean that in every instance it will be you know proof that that theatre audience laughed on that occasion. But as you say, there, there will be, you know, you have thought hard about the ways in which people responded to spectacle in this period and the kinds of affective responses they had. So there's always, there's always a grounding. Yeah. And then, and then the, and then the narrative kind of takes off from there and, and remains in close dialogue. So, so it's this kind of wonderful yeah. back and forth between, I between the specifically provable. For me, I mean, it was a case of making some of that academic work that we do um, as writers visible within a trade book. And I thought that was important to do. It's up to the reader whether they, you know, go to those footnotes or not, um, or ignore them completely. Although I did make a point of making sure that most of the footnotes, apart from where I was looking at manuscripts, and there, there is, alas, a lot of manuscript material, which is behind paywalls, that Rose Journal and other um, key texts that I was using were essentially open access. So they are publicly freely available, not only within institutional kind of settings, but beyond that, if people wanted to look at them. But I think just having that intellectual labor visit, visible, if not actively you know, necessary for the readers is important, particularly in the current, environment in the current landscape of arts and humanities, um, where there is so much debate about and so much discourse about the arts and humanities being in some ways easy to do. You know, it's something that you just do and it's an easy degree. Um, STEM is much more difficult because it has to deal with evidence. The implicit kind of attribution there seems to be that arts and humanities don't. So for me, as a scholar in the arts and humanities, it was particularly important to make that present and visible, even and particularly in a trade book. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. No, I think it's a book that makes a case exactly as you say for, for the things we can know and for the work involved in coming to know them, but also really changes our sense of what we can do with them once we know them. And it's that kind of combination that I think is so wonderful about it. So um, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Sue, for your conclusions. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thanks,